Today's keynote is the future of learning and the design of schooling. Uh, our guest keynote speaker here is Dr. Richard Elmore, who's a research professor at Harvard School of Graduate Education. Dr. Elmore joined the faculty of Harvard Graduate School of Education in 1990, having previously taught at the College of Education at Michigan State University and the Graduate uh, School of Public Affairs, Washington University. He's a member of the National Academy of Education and a past president of the Association for Public Policy and Management, the national organization representing graduate programs in public policy and management. He has held positions in the federal government as a legislation, legislative liaison with the US Congress on education policy issues. He is currently director of the Doctor in Educational Leadership Program at Harvard Graduate School of Education. His current research and clinical work focuses on building capacity for instructional improvement in low performing schools. He spends at least one day per week in schools working with teachers and administrators on instructional improvement. He's also the co-author of Instructional Rounds in Education, a network approach to improving teaching and learning of the Harvard Education Press and author of School Reform from the Inside Out Policy Practice and Performance. And I know I think he's got another book, whether it's uh, co-authored or, or, or solely in his name, that's on its way uh, quite soon. So please uh, join me in giving a really warm welcome to uh, Dr. Elmore, our keynote speaker for today. Well, it's, uh, it's a rare privilege to be here, um, and thank you for this invitation. I want to begin with just a little uh, elaboration on my biography. Uh, I had been at uh, the Ed School for about uh, 10 years, uh, doing mainly uh, teaching the basic public policy and politics course and the uh, uh, organizational behavior course. Uh, and uh, my research basically had to do with studying the impact of uh, state and local policy changes on schools and classrooms. So early on in that process, we wrote a book about uh, the relationship between how schools are organized and what happens in classrooms. And uh, as part of that process, I worked with a woman by the name of uh, Penelope Peterson uh, at Michigan State, who uh, I don't know whether you know that name. She was sort of the goddess incarnate of uh, observation and analysis of instructional practice at that stage of her career. So she really. I was an apprentice, basically, to her and her research assistant, uh, uh, trying to learn how to unpack uh, this complicated system of behaviors called the classroom. Uh, that, that had an immeasurable impact on me, both in terms of my own teaching uh, and in terms of uh, my career trajectory. Uh, around 2000, I decided that I was, uh, to be blunt, sick and tired of studying uh, schools and classrooms as objects uh, of public policy. And uh, I was going through other life transitions at that particular moment, so I decided why not add another one. Uh, and so I um, uh, said there, ha there has to be a, a reason why we have tenure uh, in institutions, and, and that must be that at some point in your career you get to decide to do something else. And so I made this resolution to uh, I made two resolutions, but the most important one was to spend a day a week in classrooms. I had to find an excuse to do that. Uh, the other resolution was 
I, I'm, I've always been interested in teaching as a profession. So I, so I said, how do, how do professions solve this problem of socializing their members to norms of practice? And we, we sit in Boston in the middle of one of the uh, most interesting environments for this, which are the teaching hospitals of the medical schools in Boston. So I wheedled my way into um, a couple teaching hospitals and put on my scrubs and uh, for a year and a half followed uh, doctors around on rounds uh, in hospitals listening carefully and recording what I saw about how um, this complex process of developing norms of practice is taught through interpersonal interaction around actual cases. And that was the origin of the development of the practice and the book uh, called Instructional Rounds in education. How many people have done rounds in this room? A few, okay. Try it out. It's, um, it's an interesting practice. So um, that resolution, I spend a day a week in classrooms, it, is, it falls into the class of be careful what you wish for. Uh, I think that Last time I tried to calculate this, it was somewhere between 4,000 and 4,500 classrooms, 250 schools, uh, five states, four countries. Uh, um, and uh, I, want, I, want you to, I wanted you to hear that part of my experience because it, it, it has shaped where I am right now and what I present to you today. Uh, on the one hand, it, it was incredibly inspiring, like being with teachers and school leaders in classrooms, developing the discipline to observe, analyze, and predict what the learning is and to actually make decisions about how to change what's going on in classrooms and to develop some sort of common norms around what that would look like. Uh, that, that turned out to be quite inspiring. Uh, the part of the practice that was not inspiring, and I think deeply depressing, was uh, we have this saying, which we talked about a few minutes ago, called task predicts performance, which is the actual work that students do predicts what they will know as a consequence of doing it. And there, there were two main results from our observations, which incidentally track pretty heavily now with the broad scale data of uh, classroom processes in the US. The first is that um, on a good day with the wind behind you, something like 70 to 75% of the interactions between teachers and students in classrooms in the United States are memory tasks. The other finding is that um, for the most part, when asked to characterize the tasks the teachers are giving students, they do not categorize them as memory tasks. They categorize them in terms of what I would call aspirations. Uh, I'm teaching higher level thinking skills. When in fact, if you take the actual task, what they're asking students to do is to um, memorize and remember things. So that's, our, that's my point of departure for today, which is uh, I'm gonna take you on a quick tour of the neuroscience of learning and where I think the field is going. Uh, and then I'm gonna show you some examples of what I think are what I'll call precursors. I don't like the idea of models or uh, you know, 
this horrible term, scalable practices, which I think has almost no meaning. It's a technocratic term. Uh, but, but people who are actually testing the limits of our understanding of how human beings learn and have created physical settings where they have done that and they have broken many, many of the rules of school. Uh, and uh, I find, what I find in the work of those precursors uh, that is consistent with uh, where I think the neuroscience is going. Uh, now, one big worry. There is a massive industry developing in, uh, on the research side uh, in the neuroscience field around how human beings learn. Uh, I would say that in the short term, educators are fortunate in that neuroscientists aren't particularly interested in practice or in school. I'll show you two people who are interested in that, and I've used them in my online course as exemplars of people who will potentially lead us into the future of learning. But for the most part, uh, educators have been saved from being exposed to and influenced by the neuroscience of learning uh, uh, by just the simple neglect of the people who do the research. Uh, but the, 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 the problem I'm presenting you, to you this, today, this afternoon, is that uh, this is a vast stream of knowledge that is going to turn upside down our understanding of how human beings function as learners. This river of knowledge is going to have to go somewhere. It doesn't have to go through schools. But it's going to go somewhere. And the question is, which how, what piece of this social enterprise called learning are schools going to capture, and, and which piece are they going to give away? And uh, because society will not sit still for, as the knowledge base develops, will not sit still for uh, the entire knowledge base of the neuroscience of learning being filtered through the institution called schools. They just won't stand for it. Uh, because it's, it's going to vastly change uh, how we think about uh, human beings and, uh, and their learning over the life course. Uh, so schooling is very much in the present. We think about schooling as a day-to-day -day activity. It's urgent, and we have uh, basically a captive audience uh, because of mandatory attendance policies and the brutal uh, reality of the attainment structure, which means that you know, uh, our definition of success is how you progress through a program grade structure and uh, whether you meet the marks and whether you're considered through testing, various kinds of testing and assessment to, to be meritorious and whether you deserve to succeed. Uh, that's basically a very presentist idea. Uh, it's, not, it's not a set of institutions that are built to imagine a future, but there are people who are in the world uh, going about imagining uh, the future, and they're not necessarily doing it in schools. They're doing it in a multitude of settings. So, um, and, and also learning is so much larger uh, a human activity than schooling is. Uh, I just like to remind people that uh, uh, children have accomplished the two most complicated cognitive tasks they will ever have to master in their entire lives by the time they're ever exposed to or corrupted by school. Uh, the first is language, and the second is what's called theory of mind, the ability to 
understand and anticipate through human interaction the possible motives and emotions of another human being. Those are developmentally the two most complicated developmental tasks that human beings have to accomplish. And they do that in the space between birth and uh, four or five. So that learning is, is a powerful force. Um, and I think we're facing a situation in which uh, we've, got, we've got competing ideas of learning and schooling that are going on and emerging. One has to do with learning is essentially the transfer of information, that it's, that it's connected to a set of institutions that are dedicated to social control and to attainment, that is to determining the life course of people through the uh, transmission of knowledge and the assessment of their quote unquote merit and potential. And that uh, uh, we, use, we use assessments to make uh, life-altering decisions about, uh, about kids and about the environments in which they're supposed to be learning. There's another idea that's in the pipeline, and that is that learning is not really about the transfer of information. It's really about uh, the ability to consciously modify your beliefs, understandings, and actions in the presence of evidence, experience, and reflection. That is, it is a continuously developing human activity that occurs independently of the institutional setting in which you do it, and it is, a pro it is a profoundly developmental project that occurs over the course of a lifetime. That schooling intervenes in that process, and it tries to intervene in that process in a, in a constructive way. Sometimes does, sometimes doesn't. But the social control and uh, attainment aspects of schooling often get in the way of the developmental project uh, called learning. And we, uh, we make judgments that essentially, you know, in the schools I've done observations in, it's, it's pretty easy to see the third of the population of kids in school for whom uh, school is really not a functional learning environment. They, they are survivors uh, of, the, of the environment and we reward s survivors. Uh, thank heaven or, we'd have, or they'd be all on the street. Uh, one project I do is in the youth correction system in uh, San Diego County and uh, the kids who were in the youth correction system are the shadow of the attainment structure. They have made deliberate choices to, to leave the command and control environment uh, it, that's incompatible with who they are as individuals. Uh, so schooling could, be, could become organized learning, or it could not. And uh, assessment could be the, the development and understanding of knowledge about how learning occurs. And I think that these two things are going to be in tension with each other. And as the neuroscience develops, we're going to feel this much more strongly. I'll show you an example later uh, of an organization that doesn't even try to challenge schools at all, doesn't even pretend to offer an alternative to schooling where parents are flocking to put their kids and get them out of a schooling environment. Uh, and they're more than willing, the parents and the kids are more than willing to run the risk of stepping out of the attainment structure in order to achieve a different kind of learning environment. So there is going to be some tension uh, between these two views uh, in the future. OK, I could teach a 13-week course on this. I'm just going to do the classic comic book version. But it's really important to understand kind of a couple basic themes about where the neuroscience is going. This area of the brain is uh, evolution, in evolutionary terms and in developmental terms, it's the, it's the reptilian part. It's the precursor of uh, human cognition. But it also happens to be the place, the amygdala here, and, this, and the hippocampus are, 
are the seat of uh, emotion uh, and uh, reaction and uh, pleasure and risk uh, and the source of all those endorphins and uh, cortisol things that cause us to be frightened and to take pleasure. So that the, what's going on there, and notice, I just want you to notice that the memory function is located in the reptilian part of the brain. This is really important. So when you're giving kids memory tasks and you're expecting them to give back to you the information you have transmitted to them, you're dealing with the part of the brain that is totally corrupted by their emotional reaction to the setting and the context in which they're working. And everything you give them is colored by the emotional response that they have to that setting at that particular moment in time. And if it activates the amygdala, it, di it disappears down a rat hole. You can bring it back, but bringing it back is a lot tougher than getting it right in the first place. So the connection between affect and memory, if you think that memory plays an important role in learning, uh, is critical. And the context in which uh, people learn is critical to the ways in which the human brain operates. The prefrontal cortex is the more highly evolved part of the brain, and that's where we make decisions, create plans, understand the world through analysis and comparison, and interestingly, there are two parts of the prefrontal cortex that operate in concert around the activity called creativity. Uh, one part is the, is, the, is the part of the brain that, that engages you and focuses you and keeps you on task. The other part of the brain is the subliminal part that communicates directly with the reptilian part of the brain. And Creativity, when they put um, creative people in fMRIs and they do brain scans of them, doing, being creative, um, creativity requires you to disable the linear control-oriented part and activate the subliminal part. That can be learned. This is a very important Thing to understand. To the degree that we begin to understand how the human brain works, we can actually create settings and contexts in which people learn how to manage this three pound organ that has 200 trillion connections. Somebody said that that's the number of celestial bodies that we are able to identify in the universe in one three pound organ, okay? So what is the project of learning developmentally according to this model? So experience is always processed in context and it's always processed first here and then here. It's always processed first in the context of the reptilian part of the brain, your emotional reaction to it, and it's then transferred in various forms and distributed across the brain. The way, the way it shows up is through the creation of neuronal connections. One of the interesting facts about development is that you, when you're two years old, you have basically twice as many neurons in your brain as when you're 18. So between, now just think about, these kids are in school. All this is happening while kids are in school. You're taking that random collection of cells, half of which end up having no function whatsoever, and you're organizing it over a 16 year period into an organ which has a structure. 
It has meaning, and it is the elaboration and the arborization and the control mechanisms that, that will be available to you to go on with the rest of your life. It can, that process can be reversed, it can be altered. There's such a thing as neuroplasticity that allows you to exercise control over that. But in order to exercise control over that, after you've done this consolidation and arborization and reorganization of neurons, it has to be deeply intentional and it has to be, you have to have enough self-knowledge to be able to pull it off. So, um, one of the determinants of this is consciousness and self-evaluation, and that occurs in concert between the prefrontal cortex. So the development of the ability to stand back and analyze yourself as a learner and to understand what errors mean and how to, to self-correct them and repeated opportunities to practice that, I might add, without adult supervision <clears throat> is a key determinant of what your autobiography is as a learner. And your autobiography as a learner is your self-understanding and is heavily uh, colored by what's called executive function, which is your beliefs and understandings of your ability to cause things to happen in the world and to engage in uh, interpersonal discourse and to have an identity in relation to the tasks that have meaning for you in the world. Uh, so you develop agency and control through practice, uh, and you develop agency and control through making uh, moves that have consequences and then adjusting and recalibrating in the face of those consequences. You arrive at what's called self-characterization, which is you understand yourself as an agent in the world and as a learner. And then finally, um, memory is totally unreliable measure of learning. It's, if you read any of the research, cognitive research on memory, you realize that um, uh, memory is the least reliable uh, index of what you've learned, in part because of the contextual problems of learning. Everything that gets stored in the hippocampus, the memory site, comes in context. It, it's, there's no such thing as neutral memories. There's no such thing as facts in the brain. Everything comes in, stimuli and information come in in a particular context. That's what goes into storage. Not the fact, but the fact in the context of the experience in which the fact uh, was, was encountered. That fact set, that, that collection of experiences, gets altered over time in light of uh, later experience. So when we give kids memory tasks, we're essentially asking them to store information and give it back to us in the form in which we thought we gave it to them. Now remember, our observation said about 70% of what we observed as tasks in classrooms were memory tasks. And we're judging their fluency as learners based on their ability to recall without regard for the context in which the information was transmitted. Where the neuroscience is going is to say, it's not that memory is unimportant as an index of learning. It's saying that it's executive function control, conscious construction of my autobiography as a learner, and agency in the world the ability to engage in action and self-evaluate that constitute the most powerful elements of learning. Once those things are under control, memory can be a powerful source of learning. But if they're not under control, memory as an index of learning is practically useless. So I'm gonna give you four precursors, just examples of organizations that I'm currently working in and I'm familiar with. I'm, I'm currently doing this work in, I don't uh, probably 12 settings. Uh, these, are, these are four of the, I think, the most interesting ones because they 
exemplify some of the principles that I think are coming out of our understanding of the neuroscience of learning. This should be familiar to you. If you don't know about it, you should. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a studio that's located halfway between Harvard and MIT on Mass Avenue. Uh, they bring in uh, uh, somewhere between 40 and 50, uh, 14 to, no, I think maybe 13 to 17 year olds in six week cycles over the course of a year. Uh, it is, uh, it's, a, it's a design studio and the practice is, uh, the studio practice from architecture. It's a, it's a learning model that they use in architecture schools. Uh, and it's a highly, uh, at one level, it's a highly scripted practice. It involves the creation, uh, you know, the definition of a problem, a design problem, the creation of prototypes, and then systematic uh, critique of those over. And at New View, they do this in, I think, four or five cycles over six weeks. So the definition of a good design problem at New View uh, is uh, a problem about which the adults don't know anything more than the kids do. So they've done immigration and refugees. They've done uh, adolescent health. They've done uh, mobility for uh, people with uh, cerebral palsy. That actually won them the White House STEM Award. Uh, mobility for kids with uh, cerebral palsy. Um, and they've done interesting, a whole raft of interesting things. So you show up on day one. They explain to you in the course of one day what the studio model is, what the practice is. They ask you to run a, a quick simulation of it just to check for a little bit of understanding about the basic elements of it. They put the problem on the table. And they put, they ask kids to self-organize, uh, pick a pick a partner or a team, uh, and go to work and see if you can come up with a prototype that you think responds to the problem. Uh, now, the thing you should understand about this is these are partnerships with uh, middle and high schools in the area. One is an elite. Uh, day school, board, uh, private school, but several of them are uh, uh, second and third chance charter schools, kids who've been in and out of school three or four times and the local comprehensive high school in Cambridge and uh, various other schools. Uh, they, they dump this r random collection of kids into this environment and put them to work. Uh, within the first 10 days, you're expected to create a prototype of some response or solution to the problem, and then you go through this very rigorous uh, critique process in which everyone critiques the prototype, and uh, you have to distill out of that critique the, the design changes you will make in the next thing, and you do this repetitively until at the end of the design process, you have a finished uh, response to the problem. Um, this is a highly stimulating environment. There's every imaginable toy in this environment that you, a, a kid would ever want uh, to do this work. Laser printers, laser cutters, uh, every imaginable type of uh, technology. The people who run the operation are a group of architects who are trained at MIT. They are really not very interested in school and they're not very interested in education. Uh, and they have an incredibly loyal uh, constituency to the point where parents uh, come in and uh, say, can I send my kid here? And they just uh, two years ago put their first student in into the Rochester Institute of Technology without a high school diploma and without a GED. She went straight in on her portfolio. I just want you to keep that in your head, okay? These things are possible. Uh, that's me being uh, 
tutored in a uh, little Mexican village uh, outside of Guanajuato uh, by Marie Cruz, who's 14 years old. And she is tutoring me in a hopelessly complex um, geometry problem, which I survived by the skin of my teeth. Uh, Marie Cruz is part of a social movement in Mexico called Tutoria, which is in 9,000 schools in the middle grades and the lower end of the high school system, which is entirely based on the tutorial method. The, you, uh, their adults come in, they teach the tutorial method, which is, a, which is a very disciplined approach to understanding a narrow band of content. They go deep into the content. One of the nice things about Mexico is they do have a very classical curriculum so that nobody teaches it in Mexico except tutoria, but uh, so that they're, they're like endless materials that students can use to become tutors. When you, uh, you go through an initial process of le learning the tutorial process with an adult, and then uh, over time you develop, uh, like it's the best analogy would be something like a merit badge. You develop expertise in a particular area. You give an exhibition in, in uh, uh, Santa Rosa, which is this community. The mothers can't come out when the exhibitions are on. They put up a big blue tarp. They cook a big lunch. The fathers come in on horseback and the local mariachi band comes and plays, and the kids stand on the, uh, the cement block steps of this primitive two-room concrete uh, school, and they teach a topic. And if the students and the adults uh, agree that the students have demonstrated mastery of that content domain, and that particular thing, they're uh, they're authorized to become tutors. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is um, it solves a big problem in Mexico, um, which is shortage of qualified teachers. And I just want to tell you, I've been tutored now in about 25 subjects by these kids all over Mexico, in uh, Mexican history and literature, in poetry, in uh, science, in uh, mathematics, I've been tutored in uh, orphanages on the uh, Mexico-California border. I've been t tutored in tiny villages in deep uh, rural parts of Mexico. Uh, I, this is the best, uh, the best learning I, as an adult, have ever experienced. Um, so uh, I just want to say, in the neuroscience literature, there's something, there's, there's a stage of development which is characterized by something called theory of mind. And what theory of mind is, is the ability to imagine yourself as the other person and what your affect would be toward what you are doing. In other words, it's a reciprocal understanding of this process. Now, it turns out that theory of mind, it's, it's been very controversial, it's been thought to develop fairly late developmentally, which means around the age of five or six. Uh, it, you should see the early signs of it. Uh, actually, one of the books I'm going to show you, one of the women who, who's done this research has discovered that that finding is a total artifact of education ease, and that uh, the theory of mind starts to develop at, uh, around 18 months. But what, what Tutoria demonstrates is, is that how, how central theory of mind is to learning. Because in order to be a good teacher, and I, I had this, I've had this experience now innumerable times with these kids, the discipline of tu tutoring has to put you in the situation of imagining the misconceptions that the person you're talking to have about the content you're trying to teach. So the two, the tutorial process is really a process about bringing people into consciousness about how other people think 
and deepening their own knowledge of the content by understanding all the possible misconceptions that people bring to the content. I think that in terms of neuroscience, this is, doesn't require any money. It's all done on a total bare bones budget. Uh, the adults uh, are basically, they run a social movement. Um, and uh, it's one of the most powerful demonstrations, I think, of, uh, of where the neuroscience is going around learning, if anything I've seen. And it, it stems from a basic trust that um, uh, the, the reciprocity between adults and kids around the project called learning is very malleable and very flexible. And you can transfer the whole enterprise at some point if you have confidence in the ability of people to exercise judgment and understand themselves as learners. This is a project I'm involved in in uh, China, a uh, design project. The thing I want to say about this is that this is a, uh, a state-funded project in Beijing where the, um, uh, the government has, uh, has said essentially design a learning environment that you think looks like the future of learning in China without any constraint on what it looks like. And if you know anything about Chinese schools, you know that they're really uh, a mess, basically. Um, uh, and so they're trying to solve a real, a really serious problem. This is a group of educators who got together and uh, they decided uh, the, the, the principal of the school is a fascinating guy. He's, uh, he speaks not a word of English and he has memorized uh, uh, John Dewey and Ivan, Ivan Illich in translation <laughs> as his lodestar for learning. So he came into this as a progressivist. And the first couple years we went there, you would see what would be a kind of a model US progressive classroom. Students sitting in groups, engaging in deep conversation about the content, teachers uh, masterfully orchestrating the content, uh, allowing kids a lot of voice. And uh, it, this is totally at odds with the Chinese, dominant Chinese model of schooling. And so we all said, congratulations. You're really doing a good job here. This looks really great. Why don't we give it a shot? They're supposed to do 25 of these in one region. And, Beijing, 25 versions of this school. And the principal looked at me and he said, I'm being, you know, just being translated. He said, this was way too easy. These kids can do way more than we imagined they could do. So in the two successive years we've gone back, this school has radically changed from that kind of prototype progressive model into a, an almost completely individualized learning environment where kids work at their own level developmentally across a broad band of content areas. They have a relatively unstructured uh, social organization and the adults are, are uh, basically on demand uh, as, uh, as tutors and as uh, orchestrators of various what we call more modes of learning, individual, pairwise, groups, direct instruction, exploration, et cetera. Which leads me to the next, and I just want to say, this all happened in the space of about three years. They started from a very conventional Chinese culture and went to this highly individualized model in the space of, of three years. And this is a, this is a set of I, uh, about 30 schools that I've worked in in Victoria, Australia. It's a, it's a variation of what I just described, which is um, if you're a quote unquote student in this school and you're new to the school, uh, basically, um, you get a, uh, a three-week period at the beginning of the school year in which to learn the practice. And the practice is there are three or four modes of learning. You are 
ultimately responsible for choosing the mode of learning. Now these are these kids are years four and five, so they're a ten and eleven years old. You as a student will be responsible for choosing the mode of learning that you uh, think is best suited to what you're expected to learn. You are also responsible for uh, choosing the content. This this is gonna this really scares teachers. Uh, so, so what you have is a structure, and so what you get in the induction period is you get a map of the structure of the content that you're expected to learn, and your job is to learn how to make choices about what you learn when and how. That uh, collection of stuff over by the window is a bunch of individual student portfolios. The job of teachers is to be on demand to do various modes of uh, instruction. There is no direct teaching because the teaching, the direct teaching is uh, it's considered to be incredibly inefficient use of adult time because the, uh, the teachers all do direct instruction on video and then the kids just turn it on when they need it and turn it off when they don't. So we have 10 and 11 year olds who buy uh, six weeks into the school year are totally in charge. And uh, when you go to visit these schools, uh, basically um, the, uh, the head of the school takes you in and hands you to a student and says, and the student explains the way the process works and uh, what's going on there. Now, uh, I don't know whether you follow the international evidence. I don't put a lot of credence in it, but uh, the last time I checked, uh, uh, 15 year olds in Australia are um, in the top six on PISA. Uh, so something must be going on uh, in, uh, in, in these schools. Uh, there's no real distinction between high poverty schools and otherwise. So what I'm gonna do is since we have a little bit of time here before I go into the wind up, I'm just gonna ask you to turn to a partner and say, what makes me angry about this presentation? <laughs> what puzzles me about this presentation? What makes me feel comfortable or uncomfortable about this presentation? Do these examples have any meaning at all? And then I'll take a few comments and protests uh, before I wind up, because I have homework for you. Uh, Okay, so let's just take like three minutes, turn and talk. Okay, could you just uh, give me the benefit of some of the, some of the reactions and responses? Anybody? Be careful when you stretch. Yeah. I can repeat the question to you or the response. I asked my partner here in conversation what made her angry with what she learned. You know, she said nothing. I love it all. I wish I could do it all that way. Um, and I said, so maybe perhaps you're angry that you can't. Yeah. That you're what makes you angry? Stuck. Nothing about the examples makes me angry, but what makes me angry is we can't, right? And uh, now, notice the, the variety of settings here, right? Because tutoria is a guerrilla movement, basically. It's a social movement where it just comes in and takes over these rural schools and puts adults in them who are highly committed. Uh, New View is a total you know, orthogonal organization. This, these are government schools in Victoria. And, and like I said, th this, is a, this is a school that was designed by teachers, basically. They got a $150,000 grant and an architect to design the school. And then they came up with the learning theory. And it's now been replicated 30 or 40 times. Uh, so these are a variety of settings. And so one of the things that might make us at least inquisitive, if not angry, is why do we, why are we so inflexible about the way we think about school, right? Because uh, the Australians say, if it works, we'll build it. 
they happened to have a capital crisis and their buildings were falling down, so they had to build something, so they just gave teachers a bunch of money and said, design it, basically. Yeah. Uh, assessment. Yeah. One student getting into RIT is not exactly what we would hope for. What sort of, as a scientist, what sort of assessment do you see behind these programs? Yeah. Okay, so one of the things I would say about Nuvia, I think it's a very legitimate question. And I wrote one of the basic articles about getting to scale with, and I wish I could retract it because I think it's a totally misguided view. The idea of scalability, I think, is the worst technocratic idea that we've ever developed. But I do get the notion of how do you, what's, what are your criteria of proof? One of the things about Nuvia which, and this, which is going to get a lot of kids in, into design schools, is that they don't, they're architects, they don't know and don't care about tests. They don't give a flying fandango <laughs> about tests. So they said, okay, so we got a, we got, these kids are doing a lot of really powerful, interesting, and creative stuff. How would we prove that? to anybody who was interested. And so they just said, okay, well, let's try this. Let's just write down everything they do and create an archive for every kid. And if somebody says, gee, Katie, who's this person who went to RIT, wants to go here and she's impatient and doesn't want to wait to get a GED or whatever, um, wh what would Katie take to RIT. Well, she'd take her archive. And she did. And she also took the White House STEM Prize, which <laughs> might have had a little bit to do with it. She's actually ending up being a fashion designer. But I, so I think um, I'm not sponsoring this stuff as a universal solution to anything. But I really admire people who say, outside of the bounds of conventional wisdom in education, how would we prove that what we're doing is powerful, right? What, what's the proof point? What's the evidence? And they're more than willing to take, the, take on that challenge. Now, Australia is a, is a different example because they do have very complete and comprehensive assessment system. But it's a very interesting assessment system because it's low stakes. <laughs> So you get a lot of feedback from the state assessment. It's organized by standards. And they have a theory about accountability, which is, I've described it as, don't make a mess any bigger than you can clean up, which is they don't identify schools against an absolute criterion as being failing. They take on a caseload of schools, low-performing schools, each cycle each improvement cycle, and they either bring them out or shut them down. And they never take on more schools than they can handle. And if you do that enough over time, what you get is people who are very comfortable looking at assessments as data, and people who are um, not particularly impressed by educational measurement. Because you can imagine the theory that it, these teachers had to come up with. This is a very complicated theory. Uh, in principle, it's actually very simple to the kids, but it's very complicated, I think, uh, in principle. So I think the, uh, my response would be, these need to be contested now. We need to start the phase of constructively contesting these models and saying, exact, asking exactly what you asked, which is, I'm, I'm a potential consumer of products of NuView, what, what's my consumer protection here, right? Any other observations? Okay, I want to give you homework. 
I think the best thing you could do, there's going to be two books here, and they're chosen uh, intentionally. Uh, and I'll explain what the intentionality is in a minute. You could do worse than to organize book group discussions around these two books over the course of a year. And it is a year's worth of uh, discussion material. Both of them are written by neuroscientists who are pretty down to earth and pretty interesting and pretty interested in children and adolescents as human beings. They're very uh, humane uh, neuroscientists. Uh, Alison Gopnik ha creates this metaphor of, the, of uh, the, the, the gardener and the carpenter. The gardener builds to plan, judges the fidelity of the product by its consistency with the plan. The gardener is in partnership with nature <laughs> and judges the effectiveness of the, re of the result in terms of the coincidence between the intentionality of uh, the, the gardener and its interaction with nature. And sometimes you fail and sometimes you succeed. It, you, don't, you don't become a good gardener by following a plan. You become a good gardener by studying what you're doing while you're doing it. It's, it's pretty clear which side she comes out on. But she, she covers the neuroscience of development from birth to age five, which is the important thing. So this is the, this is the early development thing. And it's a good introduction to all of the capabilities that human beings have as learners prior to, we ev to the point at which we ever subject them to school, right? And this should be like the Hippocratic Oath of educators, which is do no harm to this organism, which is by evolution and biology programmed to do what we think it is our business to do. Do no harm. That should be our Hippocratic Oath. And Alison Gopnik is a good path into that. Sarah Jane Blakemore is a British uh, neuroscientist who studies adolescence. And this is uh, the, uh, the uh, book that basically describes in very vivid detail how human beings develop their autobiographies as learners uh, during this critical period uh, from about uh, age 10 to age 27 which is the developmental period in which we settle on an identity and the critical period uh, of what we have come to call adolescence. In doing so, she takes apart a lot of the mythology that I, I think school people have about adolescence, about their lack of motivation, about their impulsivity, about their you know, squirreliness, etc. She doesn't discount those things. She talks about them in terms of the developmental project that's going on inside this human being while they're going through this process and the ways in which this creates adaptive conflicts with the kinds of relationships and institutions that adolescents have to operate in. These two books together, I think, would, would help, us, help us transition into a, a mindset that would allow us to Stop being normative about these little critters and start being inquisitive. And instead of saying, I wish you would do what I asked you to do, because if you did it, you would be better off, and instead say, what's going on with you? Help me understand. I'd like to know. Right? Because that's essentially what neuroscientists do, but they do it with fancy machines and things, right? OK, in conclusion, what the precursors have in common? Less is more. The theories are fairly simple. And there's no difference between what the adults know about the learning theory and what the kids know about the learning theory. It's totally transparent. So there's no magic teaching behind the curtain. 
that the teacher knows going to spring on some really brilliant surprise at the end of the lesson, which is going to transform the way you think about the universe. No. Everybody's in the same project. Everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody understands the practice in the same way. The studio model is the same for the adults as it is for the kids. Tutoria is exactly the same as it's practiced by adults as it's practiced by kids. You know, the, the models of learning are totally transparent. Uh, the, the belief that learning is optional, or that learning is innate and teaching is optional, is critical because what the neuroscience is doing is it's challenging us to explain the value added of teaching. And believe me, that is going to become a contested question. Because there are going to be so many different types of learning environments available to people in the future that schools are really going to have to compete uh, for the franchise. Uh, curiosity over certainty. Ask why instead of saying, I wish you would just shut up and do what I ask you to do. right? And it, it'll be good for you in the end because you'll make a million dollars more in lifetime income, so shut up and go to college, right? Uh, no, we should be asking why. What is it? What's going on here? I, I, can't, I can't tell you. I developed doing instructional rounds, I developed something called the parking lot screen, which is at the end of the day after we'd observed 12 or 15 classrooms and debriefed and done an analysis, uh, I would walk out to the corner of the parking lot and scream. Uh, uh, and what were the things that made me scream? Protestations, the kids have no motivation to learn. Bull. <laughs> Human beings are programmed to learn. If they're not motivated to learn, it has to do with the context that we've created because their life is about learning, right? So our job is to figure out how to do that. Uh, and the other thing is, if kids would just pay attention to what I'm trying to teach them, I would uh, be much more successful. Well, attention is a very complicated thing that has to do with deep-seated motivation and context. And if the context doesn't encourage attention, then we should feel insecure about the context, right? Because I'll tell you, the kids in that Australian classroom have no difficulty at all paying attention. They're totally riveted on learning. They have to kick them out of school at the end of the day because they won't leave, right? They're happy, they're well-adjusted, they love what they do. They think it's a natural practice. Uh, and given it the opportunity, people will learn what they need to do. Our job is to help them develop the capability to do that. And, and that's the meta task, much more important than uh, remembering content. So I hope that I, what I was hoping to do is to um, invite people into this next stage, but also to scare you a little bit because um, the, the analogy I use is this learning is breaking out. And thank heaven that it's happening now because we have problems that have problems that have problems facing us uh, as, a, as a society and as a world. To the degree that we don't engage large swaths, possibly everyone, in this project of learning how to learn and how to develop their capabilities as learners and, more importantly, how to develop their creative capacities, we're going to be in deep trouble as a society. But also, you know, hanging out with people who are curious about kids is very energizing. It's absolutely the best gas I've ever inhaled. It's, it's wonderful being around human beings who are just genuinely, genuinely curious about how other people learn 
is, is, a, is, a, is a gift. And, uh, and, I, and it's a gift that I hope that all of us in this room have access to more and more. Um, Godspeed. Wonderful, wow. Um, I feel like the challenge is before us. What will your school be? And um, I hope that you've enjoyed today. A couple quick notes on your way out. And again, a, a big thank you to uh, Dr. Elmore.